Welcome to Case by Case. This is a podcast brought to you by Luke Sadkovich and Callum Chain. How are you, Callum? I'm good. We are we are in my favorite fictional place, Chocolate City. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, I was only reading about the new uh Wonka movie this morning, how it's it's going back to uh his his early childhood. And apparently it's getting pretty good reviews. I, I find that Astonishing, having not been a massive fan of the last two <laughs> Wonka movies, yeah. but but today, yeah, today is all about chocolate. And actually, we're slightly jumping ahead to the to the um, claimant in this case, who is Chocolate City Limited, which is sadly nothing to do with um, confectionery, um, but it is a record label, a very successful record label in Nigeria. And I was just doing some background reading on Chocolate City and. Uh, let me read you the first few words of the Wikipedia article. Chocolate City is a Nigerian record label founded in 2005 by lawyer Odu Maikori. So here we have a lawyer let loose in the wild to create an extremely successful record label, but where the, where lawyers tread, litigation is never far behind. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. I didn't know the backstory. Now, that, that actually puts some context on the whole application, which we'll get into in a minute. But yeah, Nigerian music, Chocolate City. Um, yeah, uh, I, you know what? We should, um, we should use some of their tunes for the, for the intro clip for this, uh, this podcast. Apparently, <laughs> and I've been, I've just been reading about it just before we came on, but apparently it is, um, one of the, preeminent uh, record labels out of Nigeria for unearthing Nigerian musical talent. So they're clearly doing something right. And and that makes sense too in the context of this one, because clearly they were doing more successful than um was anticipated. The the nature of the dispute suggests that they had that they that they that they were succeeding um and trying to get out of a deal that would be extremely good for somebody else if the company was to succeed. Yeah, exactly. And we'll explain that in a minute. But uh, even just the fact that they did a um, uh, a deal with Warner Music Group of Companies in the first place um, said to me that they, that, you know, they were they were worth backing um, mm. in those early phases. So basically, let, let me get the the citation out of the way. Uh, we're dealing with a um, a high court uh, decision, commercial court decision from England. Uh, this was before Mr. Justice Foxton. Uh, recently, on the 16th of November, 2023, uh, the claimant is Chocolate City Limited and the defendant is WEA International Incorporated. As I said, that's part of the, the Warner, the defendant is part of the Warner Music Group of Companies. Um, and the neutral, neutral citation number is 2023-EWHC2874-COM. Um, yeah, and so this was all about a, um, a convertible note deal where, um, uh, should we just call them Warner maybe? War Warner, um, uh, offered a loan to um, Chocolate City. They entered into a deal, uh, and this was for some early financing, um, presumably before the the company had its massive successes um, that, that Callum's referring to. Although it was, it's relatively recent actually. the The facility agreement was only March twenty nineteen. So um, maybe maybe the the band's been around and doing. Oh, band the music company has been around and doing. Uh, doing well for you know for quite a period of time. Anyway, um, the there was a debate about the nature of um, the prepayment rights, if any, under this facility. And um, as Callum was alluding to, uh, Chocolate City were trying to pay back the loan uh, to WEA. Uh, and avoid WEA -E uh, Warner um, exercising its rights to take equity to convert the note into equity at the maturity date, and presumably that's because the company had increased in value and the equity was uh, was a good deal to take rather than um, just getting the 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 loan repaid with some interest. So that's kind of the platform. It's a it's a 
contract construction case, we're looking at um, a facility agreement primarily and with some associated documents as well, which we'll get into. Yeah, it's a, as you say, it looked like this, this um, financial structure where effectively Warner ha- Warner had uh, the last six months of the of the, um, the the six months up to the maturity date of the loan um, in which to exercise the option to take the equity and Chocolate City were effectively saying no we're going to pay you out before we hit that six month period so it's too late if you want the equity I'm sorry it's too bad we've already paid you out loan is done um, and it was a nice confined question of arbitration and I suppose an, an interesting procedural point on this is that each side was arguing for a su- summary judgment so both sides were saying you, you know we can we can dispose of this case summarily um chocolate city saying it's very clear that we have a right um to prepay and warner saying it's very right it's very clear that there is no right to prepay um and uh, it's I suppose you, you see this not infrequently, but where one where one party in this in this case, um, Chocolate City, brings a summary judgment application, the other side sometimes responds with one of their own to say, well, if it's gonna be obvious it is if it's obvious if if it's obvious one way, then it's obvious the other way. Yeah. And I think <laughs> it's an interesting point here because I don't think it can be said that it was clear that there was uh, a prepayment right or that there was not a prepayment right. In in fact I th- I think the agreement was um, unclear on that and it was really a question as to which um, construction to prefer here. Um, yeah. In a way, I've got to say, I thought, you know, from the intro of this decision, and not because of how it's written, but because of the nature of the deal, that it didn't seem to make much commercial sense to me. And this was before we get into talking about you know the term sheet and the the uh, the LOI the early documents that preceded the facility agreement which i think make it even clearer what the nature of the commercial deal was here but it 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 always uh, from from my experience of these things unless it's really clearly put in that there's a prepayment right um one of the main benefits that a lender is getting in these convertible term loan deals is the ability to convert it into equity and if chocolate city could just prepay whenever they wanted uh then that would fall away now if that was expressly written into the to the deal fine okay that that would be part of it but um i'm giving the game away on where where the 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 case ultimately went but i i'm not surprised in a way that it went that direction i don't know what your your thoughts were on that yeah i I had the the exact same exact same take on it when you when you look at what the deal is and how it's structured in this convertible note where it's clear that the benefit warner receives from from having this option is that is that is that warner can decide whether they want to take the the repayment or alternatively whether they want to take the equity and it would be unusual i suppose as you say you know when when you get to the point in the judgment where they're where they're setting out the various clauses it's not impossible that there could have been a clause in there that said there is this there is this right to early repayment to terminate the loan um but just looking at the commercial or or the i guess my presumed in, um understand or my, my presumption of the com- of the commercial intention i wasn't expecting to see a prepayment right that would get chocolate city out of offering the equity yeah but it's interesting like you know, one of the points right at the end made there by by the claimant was that there was no obligation for the borrower to actually draw down on the loan um <laughs> Which you know, which leaves it in this case of what would then happen on the maturity date um, if no money had been taken down. But anyway, that, that's kind of by the by. Just just to to, to be clear on the, the the structure of of the contracts here, the primary agreement that we're dealing with and that we're construing is the facility agreement, um, and that ca- contains the key provisions on which um, the de- the decision was won or lost, but there was also an option agreement and a distribution agreement. And they were quite important because there was actually no debate taken in in the case before the court as to 
whether this was a set of contracts. It was effectively assumed or, or, or accepted that this was a suite of contracts. So whilst the court focused on the facility agreement and, and Mr. Justice Foxton came to a view on um, the position under the facility agreement in isolation, he did also go on to look at the option agreement and the distribution agreement and say, well, when you look at those further documents as well, it supports um, my original interpretation on what the facility agreement does. And I thought that was quite an interesting way of setting up the analysis. Yeah, and there, there were some interesting legal principles here. Um, the yeah, I'm just trying to find, I, I've mar I marked down the, um, the point that you were discussing there. Um, where effectively he said, the, uh, Mr. Justice Foxon said, "Yeah, we can, we can, we can look at, um, we we can look at these background um, agreements and and understand the factual background." Yeah, the case the case he re refers to here is Pren and Simmons, uh, which is a Lord Wilber Wilber Wilberforce judgment. Um, and the quote that I was looking for is, "Evidence should be restricted to evidence of the factual background known to the parties at or before the date of the contract." including evidence of the genesis and objectively the aim of the transaction. And that's, and that's where, um, you know, the, uh, Mr. Justice Foxton looks at the, um, the, the, the non-binding letter of intent, um, and looks at, and looks at some of the other documents from, from the pre-contractual period and says, these support what I was already going to say anyway, effectively. He's, he's, he, he doesn't need to rely on them to make his, to make his decision. Because in his view, the, the 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 contracts themselves are clear enough. I say contracts because it was actually a suite of contracts here. Um, but he 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 does stress that that evidence can be taken into account. It's just limited in the way that it can be used. Yeah. Well, there's there's two there's two aspects to this. One is there's a there's a primary facility agreement which is what the court is construing here with the other contracts, the option agreement and the distribution agreement. And those other contracts almost form part of the suite of contracts that are in place. And so it's natural to look at the option agreement and the distribution agreement in construing what the facility agreement um, says. And so that's that's kind of, you know, you know step number one in construing these contracts and if you find an answer there that's then the end of it um but you can also get into whether some ambiguity or where things are unclear you can get into looking at the commercial purpose and the court also did that as well and i just wanted to make clear that when it was when the court was looking at the letter of interest which preceded the contractual suite of documents and looked at the non-binding term sheet, those are pre-contractual documents that really um, it can't be used just to kind of show what the, the contracts is intended to mean. What they can do is they can, um, they can go to um, understanding what the commercial purpose may have been, not to interpret the contract itself, but um, to set the set the context, if that makes uh, if that makes sense, and I think the key quote on that. So this is with respect to the LOI and the the term sheet. Um, that the court was satisfied that these documents can permissibly be used to ascertain the commercial purpose of the facility agreement, although not to interpret its terms, and that the materials confirm. So that's the LOI and the term sheet, but do not add to the commercial purpose of the transaction as it appears from the suite of the transaction documents. So you there's kind of a, there's a, a bit of a dance going on there. Like they can be used to set the scene, if you like, but not to interpret the actual words. You've got to look at the contract primarily for that purpose. Yeah, exactly. And then when you when you go through this process of construing what the words in the contract mean, part of part of that exercise of construction is evaluating whether the preferred construction on the language gives satisfies the intended commercial purpose of the clause. Um, yeah. And to understand what the commercial purpose of the clause is, you can then look to these background documents and say, okay, what was the intention here? What was the, what was the plan to start with? Um, and clearly those documents showed 
that the plan was for Warner to have a, um, a right that they could exercise to take equity rather than repayment of loan plus interest. Um, and then, as 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 you say, that um, Mr. Justice Foxton had 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 already determined that he didn't need to do this exercise to come to a conclusion. He the conclusion stood on its uh, on on the on the terms of the suite of documents um, at issue. But had had he had to rely on these on on the cons- on on the the kind of purpose the commercial purpose test, if you like. It would have said the same thing. It, the commercial purpose would have been satisfied by the preferred construction. It was one of those cases where it was actually convenient to be able to refer to the commercial purpose because I think it it only helped bolster the original interpretation on on the, the contract itself. There are a couple of nice, if I, if I may say this, um, uh, about the judgment, but there are a couple of nice lines that I, I picked up in this one, which uh, which is not really substantive, but uh, I just I really like the turn of phrase. When the focal length of the interpretive lens is shortened to bring these documents into view, yeah, I that was that was yeah. a, that was a good one. I like that turn of phrase, and there's another classic here. The fact that the interpretive exercise must swallow a gnat of drafting infelicity does not justify an, an sorry does not justify an interpretation which must accommodate a camel. <laughs> <laughs> that's which, nice. Yeah, yeah, they were. I thought that was, I thought nice that was pretty good. Nice. So I suppose, yeah. so I suppose it, having got this far, and we have we have uh, trashed the commercial intention, um, or we've 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 made clear that both of our views on reading this were that the clearly the commercial intention. Um, must have been that there was this equity option. I suppose what we should do is look at what Chocolate City was arguing. Um, yeah. Because, yeah. Because what were they clinging to? Exactly. You know, what, what, what was it in the contracts that gave them a bit of an argument? Because the, the judge did say that he, he found, and, you know, courts often say this, let's, let's, let's be honest, but for, for counsel, for the claimant submissions, describe them as impressive. And I, I didn't get a sense that um, it wasn't worth a run, uh, actually. Mm-hmm. I, I, thought the, I thought the court thought there was something to these arguments. It didn't, didn't carry the day, but there, were, there was something in here to argue. Yeah, exactly. And, and as you'd expect, it's on the, it turns on the language of the clause uh, in particular, there was this clause eight, which was titled prepayment and cancellation. Um, and clause, clause 8.3, um, which had a subheading restrictions, said any notice of cancellation or prepayment given by any party under this clause eight shall be irrevocable. And unless a contrary indication appears in this agreement, shall specify the date or dates upon which the relevant cancellation or prepayment is to be made and the amount of that cancellation or prepayment. And then 8.3b continued, any prepayment under this agreement shall be made together with any accrued interest on the amount prepaid and subject to any break costs without premium or penalty. And the argument, as far as I understood it, was effectively saying 8.3a and 8.3b, the two passages I've just quoted, create a regime where a, cancel- a notice of cancellation can be given by any party, can be given by Chocolate City, um, and therefore, the one that Chocolate City did give was valid because it was um, contractually, they were contractually entitled to do so under clause 8.3. Yeah, it's almost like the contract refers to a right but doesn't set up that the borrower actually has that right. Exactly. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's like, yeah, that, I suppose that's the best way of putting it is that there's reference to prepayment and here and there in different ways, but it doesn't actually come out and say clearly that the borrower is able to prepay and um, that's a right that they have. And why that's important is it kind of conflicts with an express right that the lender does have. That's exactly it, there, because there there were situations where the borrower would be required to prepay immediately and maybe not prepay, but, but the, the sums would be payable immediately on demand. And and in some cases, it is you know, referred to as a prepayment. So, for example, Clause 8.1 talks about um, an illegality situation where if it, if it becomes unlawful for the lender to perform its obligations contemplated by the agreement uh, or to maintain its participation in any loan, then the, the borrower has to repay the loans in their entirety um, or as soon as the lender notifies the borrower. So that's a prepayment right. 
but it's a prepayment right in favor of the lender, i.e. the lender is the one who can demand prepayment um, if there if this illegality situation exists. So there's no situation or there's there, there's there's no there's no right in the contract for the borrower to uh, which the borrower is Chocolate City for the borrower to give notice of its own prepayment. Um, but then you have clause 8.3a that says any notice of cancellation or prepayment given by any party, um, which which suggests that actually the borrower could be one of the parties giving a notice of prepayment. Um, and yeah, it's, it, it, as you say, the, the clause, I think that's quite nicely put, the clause, the clause refers to a right that otherwise doesn't exist in the contract. Um, so the question is, does that right exist or not? Yeah, and you could see if there wasn't considerable conflict in the other direction um, or that it didn't conflict with other rights in the way that it does, that you might you might get that up in, an, in a different contract with in a different setting, even though it doesn't expressly refer to the right. If, you, you know, a contract refers to the consequences of having a right or something like that without actually stating that the right exists in the first place, it might be enough to infer that, that right does exist on the contract. But the problem here is it's running up against other other rights that go in the other direction. I thought there was an interesting point here that um, Chocolate City was arguing that if um, Warner's um, construction was accepted, that there would be certain parts of the contract that were redundant. Um, and I thought there was that, that's an interesting thing to, to think through because. Um, you know, one of the canons of construction is that you you do try to give the words of a contract meaning, um, and um, constructions that lead to redundancy is is not typically the way that you would you would look at a contract. That said, it, it is the case that even in professionally drafted contracts, that um, it's relatively common that some language in there is surplus and is unnecessary and doesn't actually need a, a meaning and can be deemed redundant. It, it's, a, it's one of those principles that can be stretched and twisted in different ways, but I, I thought that was worth noting. And um, it kind of ran into the, the other point here that um, the facility agreement drew from language and clauses uh, found in the Loan Market Association standard form. Now, the the parties kind of touched on that, or well, Warner touched on that, um, but didn't really go big on it. And I think the, the court actually commended uh, counsel for Warner in not trying to put the case um, on an amended uh, LMA type argument. Uh, but I thought that was an interesting one too, because um, the in the LMA, there is actually an express right of prepayment on the borrower's part, which can be deleted, often is deleted. Um, but that is, it, it is actually industry practice that if you have if you want to have this type of right for a borrower, it's set out in the contract. Now, it didn't fall on that point in, in this decision, um, but I thought that was an interesting um, kind of uh, footnote. Yeah, I, th I, I think there's th those two points are some of the things I really took away from this judgment, actually. One one is that there is a, there's a limit to how far you can push that argument that, well, if you're – yeah, and I think lawyers quite like this argument. They say, "Well, if you're if 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 what you're saying is correct, then this bit doesn't mean anything, and therefore what we say must must be correct." Um, basically, invoking this this rule against surplusage, the, this idea that the parties will have wanted all of the words in the contract to mean something, um, and there there is, it turns out, um, law on this recent law from the from the Court of Appeal where. They effectively water that down a little bit, particularly in 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 the uh, commercial context. And uh, it was Lord Justice Leggett in that case. The case is Merthyr, Merth, yeah. so two Welsh um, Welsh place names. So I'm not going to uh, do a very good job of this, but it's Merthyr South Wales Limited um, against Merthyr Tydfil County BC. Probably better if you're interested in following up rather than trying to type what I've just said. The easier way around way to it <laughs> is the mutual citation, which is 2019 EWCA Civ 526. But the 
the the interesting piece, uh, the interesting part of the judgment was Lord Justice Leggett, who said by it, it, it is by no means uncommon, including in professionally drafted contracts, to find provisions which are unnecessary and could, which out this, without this advantage to either party, have been omitted. So it just it it it, it just tempers. The reliance on that on that argument, um, and I think that's quite an important point for practitioners because I know how much we all love to use that surplusage argument to to um, convince everybody that our our reading of a uh, construction is is the correct one. Um, and the other point you made, I think, is is maybe even more important in some of the sector focused work we do, where we know the standard forms, you know, really well, um, and. You can almost you can almost see in a contract where someone's trying to use language where you go, well, they've borrowed that from this standard form, and the rest of the document doesn't actually bear any resemblance to the standard form that they've borrowed that wording from. Um, but because you've seen it time and time again, you want to say, well, actually, they've taken this wording from that from that standard form, and they've changed this bit about it. And if they've changed that bit, then it must mean they didn't want it to mean what the original standard form means, so they wanted it to mean something else. And you can kind of tie yourself in knots almost justifying why a clause is different to a standard form. Um, and again, the judge poured a bit of cold water on, on that in this one and suggested that, that actually there wasn't, there, there was no real, there, 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 there was no clear intention to depart from the LMA, LMA standard form in this, in this draft um, that you could see from the terms of the, of the contract itself. And it's almost to me that when I read that, it was almost as though the judge was saying, look, yes, maybe this is similar to LMA wording. Um, maybe this is based on an LMA contract, but actually, unless, unless it's very clear that the parties have agreed to depart from a standard form, we can't just say that what you've agreed means something different to the standard form. You know, the, the test is a little bit harder than that. Um, and I, I thought that was, you know, that's interesting for the, for the se sector focus work that we do in shipping and commodities, where, as I say, we, we, we know the, we know those standard forms, um, inside out. Yeah, I think it's a really good point and it's worth looking at. Um, I, I think it's easy to overstate, um, why, why a particular term may depart from a standard form and try and read into that some intention or what have you. But actually, that's not the way to interpret contracts. The, the, the way to interpret contracts is to look at what ended up in them, what was signed off, what was agreed upon um, expressly. Start from there. If you get your answer from there, that's pretty much going to be what it is. Um, yes, there's there's ways to kind of expand that and have more of a purposive approach. I think the way I look at it is um, it's almost like a proportional inverse approach um, in that the more ambiguity there is in in the draft, um, the, the more you can look at some of these other extraneous factors. But, it, you know, whether it's a standard form or it's pre-contractual uh, documentation or context or commercial purpose or, or all of that, I think the it's easy to be distracted by that when you're looking at contracts and we've done this we've had these debates between ourselves haven't we Callum yeah. on, on different yeah, yeah. on different cases and um, I think the trend uh, has been a more literal trend in the courts for some time now to look at what the actual contract says and and it's from there that you build out um, and pull in the commercial purpose not the other way around yeah exactly that's been that's been a trend for for a little while, and there's, there's some really some really interesting academic writing on on that trend. Um, it's and what's interesting at the at the senior court level, you know, right at the Supreme Court level, is that the 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 way that the inter the contractual interpretation process is conducted has clearly changed over the last you know thirty forty years, um, but it's never it's never changed in a way where they've overruled the previous decisions they've they've never said they actually looked at that one the wrong way it's always been a case of you know they've they were look, that decision is right this decision is right they're they're all right all the way through none of them have been overruled or um or or really contested or or even that heavily criticized um but the there is this sea change in in going away from from a from a really a much a much more commercial approach if you like um in inverted commas, I say commercial, and instead looking at what the looking at what the language says. 
but I think well, that, that, that's right, Callum. And you know, here on, on the point you've just been making about the standard form and uh, deviation from the standard form, you've got the 1959 case there in Louis Dreyfus and um, Panasso, uh, with um, uh, w w where you had a standard form of words that were very familiar to the commercial men people um, and contained in a printed form in general use or what have you. And in that case, the standard form did have quite a significant role to play in understanding what that contract meant. There, that's the other end of the spectrum, right? And where, where you're talking about a contract that pulls in some clauses here and there from a standard form, puts its own clauses in, changes the clauses and all of that, then um, that's at the other end of the spectrum. So, you know, it's not to say that Louis Dreyfus in 1959 was wrong. It's just that that's um, distinguished in, in this case here. Yeah. I, I didn't have much else to say on this case. Um, I, I know we could get into some other points, but I think that's th those were the main issues that came to mind for me. Yeah, agreed. And, why, and again, just going back to this specific case here, when you look at it commer commercially, again, quote unquote, because what is... It, the, the commercial argument is always the one that um, that you prefer um, on these things. But if you look at it commercially, whether you look at it uh, on a very literal interpretation, I think the result would be the same either way. Uh, you know, whatever uh, approach the court was taking, it was highly unlikely that um, Chocolate City were going to be able to get out of the equity deal that they'd structured. Um, so I think that probably puts a bow on it. And um, yeah, well, looking forward to next time, Luke. As always, thank you everyone for listening in. We hope you've gotten some, something out of uh, today's podcast. Um, we like our uh, contract construction cases. We've had a few of them on, on the podcast. So if you're interested in these, look in the back catalogue. I'm sure you'll find some others where we get into uh, contract interpretation. Uh, it's one of those areas that we, we keep coming back to both in practice and, and on the podcast. <laughs> so uh, thank you, everyone. Good to catch up, Callum, as always. And uh, take care until next time. Cheers, everybody. Bye.